Hello, my name is Dr. Christoph Corell. I work at the Zucker Hillside Hospital in Queens, New York. I'm both an adult and child psychiatrist, and I will talk today about the effectiveness of psychotropic medications in children and adolescents with severe mental disorders. Let me start with showing you my disclosure information. My focus is on psychopharmacology as well as early recognition and prevention of children, adolescents, and young adults who are on their way to develop a psychotic disorder or a mood disorder. So I do have a relationship with several companies that make antipsychotics and mood stabilizers, but my research support has been entirely free of industry support. In addition, I hope that you will see that this is a fair and balanced CME rule um, compliant presentation. What am I going to cover today? I'm going to talk about the efficacy and tolerability, those two coins to effectiveness, of several major medication classes. These include psychostimulants, antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and antipsychotics. Following that, I will talk about the monitoring and management of side effects that are very frequently observed in the children and adolescents that we treat with these medications. Let's start with stimulants. Psychostimulants have a very strong effect size in terms of their efficacy both for hyperactivity and impulsivity as well as for inattention. The effect is seen rather early and clearly in many of our patients. The effect size is around 1.0 which is considered a large effect size. 0.8 and above is considered large. 0.5 and around that 0.3 to 0.7 is moderate and anything below 0.3 is considered a small effect size. And as you can see on the slide, both methylphenidate and amphetamine products have around an equal effect size and um, the effect size is similar for both inattention and hyperactivity. Any other medication group that has been studied uh, like bupropion or antidepressants or atomoxetine have a lower effect size. These medications are used quite frequently in many of our patients, but there has been the concern that psychostimulants reduce weight and may reduce also height, and the question is how long will that last for? So on this slide here you can see a meta-analysis of uh, 22 studies that have looked at long-term outcomes in terms of weight and height in patients treated with psychostimulants. So on this here, you can, this slide, you can see the growth velocity. On the left-hand side, you see the cumulative Z-score deficit. Z-score is adjusted for sex and age of the child. And on the right-hand side, you see the rate of change in height Z-scores. And what you can observe here is that there is an attenuation of growth, particularly early on, but this attenuation actually gets smaller over time. So basically, there's almost a regression to the mean in those studies. Also what's been shown is that the taller children to begin with are more affected than the smaller children and when psychostimulants are discontinued patients usually catch up and have rather small differences as adults in terms of height. And uh, there is a question whether ADHD in itself is associated with shorter stature. What about weight? This is something that many parents are concerned about. They may actually stop the medication or uh, ask for holidays, uh, drug holidays, um, because the kids are uh, rather skinny. But what can be seen here too is that that weight reduction effect is also something that attenuates over time. Again, more so seen in the heavier children to begin with. And again, when the medication is stopped, usually the children catch up. Another big concern that has been raised and uh, has been pursued is whether or not psychostimulants that increase noradrenaline could be cardiotoxic, whether there could be a cardiac um, sudden death event rate that's higher in those treated with psychostimulants. This is a study uh, two years ago from 2007 uh, where circulatory death was coded in those that had no stimulant use, those with former stimulant use, and those with current stimulant use. And as you can see in these uh, more than 120,000 patients, um, basically the stimulant use alone was not associated with increased cardiac death. Um, so patients with former stimulant use uh, actually had a similar death rate almost like uh, no stimulant use. M since this is such a low occurrence event, um, many believe that it is a rather 
associated with structural deficits um, that uh, are apparent in children and adolescents cardiovascularly and they then die during childhood unfortunately and not so much related to psychostimulants. Uh, recently in 2009 Maddie Gould from uh, Columbia University published a case control study finding that there was in patients that had been diagnosed with sudden cardiac death that there was a higher rate of those on stimulants 1.8 percent versus 0.4 percent of patients on stimulants who were uh, found uh, dead because of other reasons but again it's unclear whether the death was really due to psychostimulants. Let's shift gears and look at antidepressants. Antidepressants also have been shown to be effective in children and adolescents. In this meta-analysis here uh, of more than 3,000 patients across 30 studies you can see that the effect size is somewhat smaller than for um, for psychostimulants, but the number needed to treat, the number of patients needed to be exposed to an antidepressant um, to get one more responder compared to placebo was rather favorable. Uh, in, in general, it was um, um, the number needed to treat was nine for a median duration of eight weeks of treatment. Interestingly, the number needed to treat reduced, got better, so less patients needed exposed to antidepressants compared to placebo, the older the subjects were. So in prepubertal individuals, the NNT was 21, which is not considered um, a meaning clinically that meaningful uh, number needed to treat. Usually 10 and below is considered meaningful, whereas uh, patients that were uh, mixed ages had a number needed to treat of 10 and those that were adolescents had a number needed to treat of 8. Here again there has been a concern about whether particularly children and adolescents are liable of having more suicidal behaviors, thoughts and maybe even attempts when treated with antidepressants. This goes down to the study that is listed here where basically the FDA pooled suicide uh, data across studies uh, on antidepressant, uh, of antidepressant use and showed that uh, basically in adults there was no increase, in elderly there was a decreased rate of um, suicide compared to placebo, whereas in children there was uh, an increased rate of suicidal behaviors and thoughts, not necessarily deaths. Now it's very hard to understand whether this is really a truly an effect of antidepressants because pharmacoepidemiologic data have shown that the more patients are exposed to antidepressants the lower the suicide rate in general is. And if you look at this study here from Waluk et al, they actually showed that um, antidepressants did not seem to actually increase the rate of suicide. Um, but what was found to be increased is in patients who took psychotherapy or received psychotherapy which is counterintuitive again just showing that maybe both the antidepressant use and the psychotherapy are markers of more severe illness and those that are more severely ill are likely to hurt themselves or think about it because of the illness. And if you look at the study by Simon here um, this is pretty clearly indicated in the sense that most of the suicide attempts actually occurred just prior to the antidepressant use. So when antidepressants are given you have patients who are um, at higher risk for suicidality. Um, whether or not there is an uncovering of some bipolar diathesis in youngsters that have not yet had their first manic episode that could contribute to a behavioral disinhibition is something that's currently being discussed. So clearly what we need to do is when we prescribe antidepressants we need to monitor carefully um, every uh, week whether it's, whether it's via telephone or um, visit just to make sure that suicidality doesn't uh, occur and also parents and patients need to be informed about uh, this risk. Um, since the black box warning though there has been a concerning increase in suicides um, which corresponds at least in an associative way with a decrease in antidepressant use particularly by primary care physicians and pediatricians. Let's move now to mood stabilizers. 
Uh, on this slide, you see basically the mean change in Young Mania rating scale scores across uh, several studies, four studies that are placebo controlled. And different from the adult studies, in only one arm was there a statistically significant difference of, in this case, divalproex or valproic acid immediate release against placebo. In the large study of looking at divalproex, uh, valproic acid, extended release uh, published by Karen Wagner, there was no effect against placebo. Question